Well, I wanna welcome you. If you are new, my name is Joey McLaughlin. And if you missed out on Monday night, you missed out on one for the history books. Can I get an amen? It was an unbelievable night as we celebrated our one year anniversary of being a church. And it was truly a night that I'll never forget. Just all of the stories, all of the moments of worship. The guy who preached killed it. And uh, it was just an unbelievable night. Um, watching the amount of hands that were raised at the end of the night, the amount of people who gave their life to Jesus and know him as savior and Lord today. Can we celebrate that? That people are crossing from death to life in this church? Now this is a church where people are meeting Jesus for the very first time, beginning to see that he is the only thing worth living for for the very first time, seeing that he's what they've been searching for their entire life for the very first time. People who didn't grow up in church, people who were far from God, people who were from other religions are finding Jesus here and it's changing everything about them. And it is such a joy to be a part of this church. And here we are. I wanna formally welcome you to year two of Elevate City, people. Yeah, come on. Now, I want for you to know how incredible it is that we are officially a two-year-old church plant. Researchers say that somewhere in the vicinity, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of church plants don't make it. 80% of church plants fail somewhere around the first year. And so the fact that we're here today, because that's pre-pandemic data, people, I don't even wanna know what the numbers are like in COVID. But the fact that we are here today and that we're not just here today, but that we're growing and seeing people meet Jesus and new people come each and every week, even on a holiday weekend, people, proves that God is up to something special at Elevate City, that he is building something unique here, something real here, and something that people need in this city and in this generation, amen? And I don't know about you, but I believe, I am just full of faith, believing that year two is going to be so much better than year one, that we ain't seen God do nothing yet, that there's so much more ahead of us than there is behind us. And I just really, with a great sense of expectation, believe that God is getting ready to fling the doors wide open on Elevate City Church. I was given this picture on a Monday night, I was talking to somebody and they, they asked if they could pray over me right before the night. And as they were praying over me, they, they kind of gave me this picture. And um, for those of you who don't know, I have a son named Haddon Crew McLaughlin. Now, if that name doesn't sound like he's either A, going to be a famous theologian or B, be the king of Ireland, then I don't know what does, right? And uh, Haddon Crew McLaughlin, I love that dude and I have tremendous expectation for his life, but so much about Haddon's life really mirrors the life of Elevate City. Haddon turns one on Tuesday. And so literally he was born on the Monday following the second Sunday of Elevate City Church. And for those of you wondering, yes, I preached on the third Sunday because my wife's a beast, okay? And so, uh, brought the house down on that third Sunday too. But so much of the story of Elevate City is kind of running in tandem with the story of Haddon. For those of you who don't know, my wife and I, we had multiple miscarriages and we tried to get pregnant and went through years of infertility and couldn't do it. And um, really that's kind of similar to my dream of planning a church. I dreamed and thought it was gonna happen and didn't happen. And so many things kind of stood in the way. And then in the middle of a pandemic, we get a baby and we see this church be planted. And um, if, you, if you don't know much about being a dad, then the first year of a kid's life, spoiler alert, they don't do much, okay? They pretty much like eat, sleep, and poop, okay? That's all that they do. So if you're a young dad, spoiler alert, it's not gonna be very much fun in year one, all right? Now, by the grace of God, I think that Elevate City's done a tad bit more than just eat, sleep, and poop, amen? But um, I was given this picture and it's so cool. Um, Haddon, um, up until really just the last couple of weeks, all he's been able to do is crawl. Now his crawl is unlike any other crawl you've ever seen in your entire life, okay? Like this dude crawls like Golem, all right? So like, if you see Haddon crawl, like you drop like a Cheerio on the ground by the stairs and you'll just start to see him all out, my precious, going towards that Cheerio, okay? Like he's got a gangster crawl. But, um, but the last couple of weeks, something's kind of changed. The last couple of days, really, something's kind of changed. And he started to take some steps. He started to walk for the very first time as he approaches his one year 
birthday. And I just believe that the same is true for us, Elevate City, that this year may have been a crawl, but that this house of faith is getting ready to take some steps for the kingdom of God, that we're gonna take some big steps forward and see God to start to do some things in our midst that are beyond our expectation. I believe that God's got some big steps that he wants us to start to take. Um, I wanna do something crazy today, kind of in honor of this being the start of year two. And it's, I wanna let you choose what I'm gonna preach on today. I wanna let you choose what I'm gonna preach on today. I'm gonna give you two options in honor of year two, and both of them will be massive steps for this house, massive steps of faith for year two, but I wanna let you choose what I preach on today, all right? So by show of hands, so there are gonna be two options, all right? Show, two, two options. Option number one is I'm gonna preach on giving, okay? I'm gonna preach on show me the money, right? Dollar, dollar bills, put it in the bank, shoddy what you think, all right? So that's option number one, money, preach on giving, okay? Option number two, massive step, is I'm gonna preach on grace, I'm gonna preach on grace, forgiveness, the gospel, the scandalous love of Jesus. Okay, those are your two options, giving or grace. By show of hands, how many people want me to preach on giving? That's where the tithers are, okay? Those are the tithers in the house today. All right, by show of hands, how many of you want me to preach on grace? Who wants me to preach on grace? Come on, somebody, I get it. Listen, that's the way that it goes, right? In any room, that would be the expectation. You talk about preaching on giving and everybody gets really awkward and uncomfortable and they're like, where's my wallet, right? Gotta hide it, somebody about to steal it. But, but you preach on grace and everybody gets excited and they lean in and they need to hear it because they know that they need it. But what I want today to be, is I want today to be this realization. I want the step that we take today to be this realization that preaching on giving and preaching on grace are actually the same thing because what the Bible says is that giving is grace. That giving is grace. I wanna preach a message for you today titled Time to Open Up a Grace Account. Time to Open Up a Grace Account. How many of you by show of hands remember the first time that you opened a checking account? Some of you guys probably never opened a checking account, right? You're like, what is a check, sir? Um, I remember when I opened up a checking account and I was so excited and my parents, they took me to the bank and they explained to me how this whole thing was gonna work and you had to save up a certain amount of money to open up a checking account. Y'all remember this? Like you had to get to the $50 mark. You had to get to the $50 mark. And so I'm cutting grass and I'm bathing dogs and I'm doing chores. I'm doing anything that I can to get that $50 amount so that I can open up a checking account. And you go down there and you're like terrified and nervous and you stand in line and you don't even know what you're doing. You're signing like your whole life away. You're giving them like blood samples and everything so that you can open up this checking account. And I was so jacked. I got that check and my dad talks to me about like balancing a checkbook and you got to fill out all these forms and write this check and put it here. And like two weeks later, I, uh, I, I couldn't balance my checkbook. I actually had an overdraft on a Big Mac, okay? <laughs> it was like, what even is this world? But it was so exciting when I opened up for the very first time a bank account. And I want that emotion that you felt when like you had money for the very first time, when you had some independence, you know, when you were I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D, -E -E do you know what that means? Like you were independent on your own, had money, you were excited, you could buy things, spend things, save for things because you had a bank account. I want that same kind of excitement, that same kind of joy to rise up in the house today when you realize that you have a grace account that there is this grace account that God has gifted you with to make impact on this world that is far greater than anything else you will spend your life on. If you have your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter eight, 2 Corinthians chapter eight, I want for you to see today that giving and grace according to the Bible are actually the same thing. 2 Corinthians eight, verse one, this is what the apostle Paul writes. He says, we want you to know Put them on blast, let them know, open up your ears. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, what the churches gave in Macedonia was money, but what Paul called it was grace. Do you see that, that the Macedonian churches gave money, but Paul's wanting to let the Corinthian churches know that what they actually gave was grace. What would happen today? If the way that you and I fundamentally saw money changed and we no longer saw money as money, but we saw money as grace, 
we saw money is actually a gift from God to us to give right back to him. What if we saw everything that we had and all that we had been given and not as something that we owned, but as something that we stewarded? Not as something that was ours, but something that we'd been entrusted with. Everything that we've got is a gift from God on loan to us to make an impact for the glory of his name. What if we started to see money as grace? Like if we wanna build a church that is fresh and that is new and that is exciting and that is compelling for this generation, a church that is innovative and that is moving forward and not shrinking back, a church that is running into places that people are running out of and bringing prodigals back home, then we're gonna have to stop looking at giving as an obligation and start to look at giving as an opportunity. We've gotta stop looking at giving as begrudging and we've gotta to start to see it as a grace. We've gotta stop looking at it as, oh, I've got to do this, I have to do this, and start to look at it as I get to do this. I have been gifted to give. I have been blessed to be a blessing. The very reason that I have this in the first place is to give it back to the one who gave it to me. We're not talking about seeing a bank account today. We're, start, we're talking about seeing a grace account today, about looking at our money in a way that actually frees us up and stops holding us hostage, in a way that moves us forward and stops holding us back, in a way that sets us free and stops tethering our heart to this world. It's time to open up a grace account today. Grace, the Greek word is the word charis, and it is the, the word that we get our English word charisma from. And the reason that we get charisma from it is because grace is so dynamic, has so many beautiful colors and dimensions to it. It is mentioned over 170 times throughout the pages of scripture. It is one of the chief messages of the Bible. Um, one author wrote that the word grace has got to be the most compelling word in all of scripture because grace is even greater than love because grace is love in action. Grace is love in action. Grace is everything for nothing to those who deserve, who don't deserve anything. Grace is everything, that you get everything for nothing, you don't do anything to earn it, to those who don't deserve anything. That's what grace is. It is this unreal gift that God has given us that we get to be in the business of giving right back to people. When uh, you give, you're giving the grace of God to someone else on your dime. When you write a check, when you engage in generosity, you are giving not money to the church, you are giving the grace of God to someone else on your dime. Every dollar I give is a grace that someone else now has. It goes from my bank account to someone else's grace account. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse two says this. It says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Did you catch that? I'm gonna read it again. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. The Bible says that the Macedonian church was hit with a math test. How many of you like math in the house today? That is the exit at the back of the door, okay? I hate math, I'm not good at math, I'm not a fan of math, okay? But the Macedonian church was hit with a math test. And here's the math test. The math test is an abundance of joy plus extreme poverty equals what? An abundance of joy plus extreme poverty equals what? Now, what would you determine the equation is? If you've got an abundance of joy and then you plus extreme poverty, what does it equal? Deferred generosity, right? Like I'll give later, I'll give when I got enough, I'll give eventually. It, it, it equals maybe service. Like, okay, I can't give, so I'll serve. It equals um, a little giving, like modest generosity. Abundance of joy plus extreme, I've got this joy, I'm really happy, I'm really grateful, but I've got this terrible situation where I'm in extreme poverty, so I wanna give, so it equals, ah, I guess the best that I can. But for the Macedonian church, the Bible says that an abundance of joy plus extreme poverty equals an overflowing wealth of generosity. Even in a situation of 
lack, in a situation of poverty, the posture of the Macedonian church was a wealth of generosity. It was not, hey, look at my situation. It was look at the God who's given me everything that I have, even if it looks to the world like I've got nothing and I'm so grateful for what he's given me that I'm gladly going to give it right back to him. An abundance of joy plus extreme poverty equaled for the Macedonian church, an overflowing wealth of generosity. Here's the truth today, church. The joy that we receive in the gospel is always greater than anything that we can give. The joy that we receive in the gospel is always greater than anything that we can give. I'm here to tell you today that you cannot outgive God. That what God has given you in Jesus is far greater than what you will ever be able to pay him back for. You cannot outgive God. Let me also tell you this God ain't hurting for money. You know that, right? Like, God is not hurting for your money. He does not need it. He does not need it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the earth, and all that is in it. Jesus don't need a new pair of shoes. He does not need your money. And so when someone allows you to give to something and they don't need your money, what a privilege it is for you to be a part of it. That he would allow us to contribute. He doesn't need it. We actually need to give for who it turns us into becoming. It's not that God needs our money. The Bible says that the Macedonian church gave in great economic distress. Now, what you need to know historically about what's going on there is that the Macedonian church is in dire straits because of their proclamation of the gospel. So the Macedonia would be like modern day Greece and the churches of Philippians. So the book of Philippians that you see in the New Testament and the uh, book of uh, Thessalonians, um, as well as uh, there's one other church, but they don't have a book written about them. So I forget them and so do you. Um, but so they all make up the Macedonian churches. And uh, so uh, he, he's writing to these three Greek churches and he's saying um, w- what's happened to them is they've been so boldly in proclaiming the gospel that they've become outcasts within society. And so they've, um, the people who they work for have stopped paying them. They've actually fired them from their jobs and they go and try to spend the money that they have at the grocery store, but people won't even take it because they are so aligned with this Christ, with this Messiah. They are part of this new movement called Followers of the Way, and they're experiencing such persecution for that that it's causing economic distress for all of the churches in Macedonia. And so they're not in a poor financial situation because of poor stewardship. They're not in a poor financial situation because they were reckless with their money. They're actually in a poor financial situation for the best reason that you could be. And it's because you put Jesus first and it costs you everything. And so in that position, not when it was like I was reckless and I'm actually the one to blame. And so ah, let me get my finances. No, 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 I've done everything right. I've been obedient to Jesus and I don't feel like I have much left to give, but I'm gonna give everything that I've got. That's the posture of these Macedonian churches. And it is on the backs of people like this that the gospel moves forward and has been moving forward for the last 2,000 years. The word overflowed is this idea that they went over and above. They went over and above. And I think the reason that they went over and above is because they understood what God had put in their joy account. And so they were willing to have a grace account that overflowed. When, when you know how much Jesus has done for you, when you know what he set you free from, when you know the price that he's paid on your behalf, you say, my bank account may be empty, but my joy account is not. And so I will freely give. I will freely give. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 says this, For they gave, according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now I'm looking for that kind of church. Please let me give. I'm begging for it. Like the picture here is like, you know, um, when you're in school, like in in, in an elementary classroom and um, the teacher has like a chalkboard, no longer a whiteboard, probably no longer, it's probably like some digital 3D hologram board. But but back when I was a young whippersnapper and uh, the teacher had like a whiteboard, right? And they'd write on the whiteboard or whatever, all of the notes in the class. And then they would say, hey, who wants to come erase the whiteboard? And what would happen to every, you know, hyper ADD boy 
in fourth grade. I wanna erase, erase the whiteboard. I wanna erase the whiteboard. Let me do it, right? All hands would shoot up to go and beg the teacher, let me erase the whiteboard. And that's the exact kind of picture that we have here for the Macedonian churches. They're going, let me do it. Let me erase somebody's sin. Let me erase somebody's shame. Let me erase the condemnation that people feel. Let me erase the loneliness. Let me erase the poverty. Let me erase the addiction. Let me erase everything that is set against people because I wanna give grace so that people can meet Jesus and experience the gospel. Let me do it. I'm begging for an opportunity to be a part of this. Don't hijack the blessing of being a blessing, let me do it, I wanna step up. You know, we got some people in our church who are like this, like I'll go out to lunch with them and I'll like go to pull out my credit card and they'll like slap my hand. Not on my watch, sir. I'm gonna pick this one up. Let me do it, let me step in and meet a need. Let me step in and serve, let me be generous. You know what the picture is? The picture is that as followers of Jesus, none of us are supposed to have alligator arms. Y'all seen this commercial before? alligator arms, like, oh, maybe somebody else will pick up the dime. Like, I would love to do it, but I just can't reach. I'm telling you that when you get to the great banquet table of faith in all of eternity, the last thing that you're gonna want is alligator arms. You're gonna wanna be the kind of person who extended their arms open and said, Jesus, it is all for you. It is all from you and right back to you do I freely give. Freely have I received, freely give do I give? What a grace it is to give grace. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse five, it says this, and this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. When you give yourself to God first, you won't have a problem giving yourself to people after that. The reason that some people struggle to give is because they have not fully given themselves to the Lord. The reason that some people struggle to give is because they have not freely and fully given themselves to the Lord. When you give yourself to God, you don't mind giving money back to God because you understand it's already his in the first place. You see, this is about growing in discipleship. This is way more about who you're becoming than what you're giving. This is about what you're holding on to this is about where you find your security. This is about where you find your identity. You know, there's a popular story about the Knights of Templar in history. And the Knights of Templar, they used to baptize into their order. They would baptize with their sword in hand out of the water. So literally as these Knights would be baptized into the Knights of Templar, they would hold their sword up out of the water. Their entire body would go into the water, but they would hold their sword out of the water. They were basically saying, God, I trust you with everything except for this one thing that I use to do all these unholy things with. You see, I kill people with this sword and I don't want that blood to be on your hands. I wanna take responsibility for my actions. And so I'm gonna hold this sword out of the water but baptize everything else. And a lot of us would look at that and go, no, 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 you can't. You gotta go all the way in the water. You can't just hold some of you outside of the water. You can't hold that sword up. It doesn't matter what that sword has done. Jesus paid for that sword. He bled for that sword. He died for that sword. So take that sword under the water with you. Do not hold that sword up out of the water. And then we stand there and we will baptize ourselves into following Jesus, but we'll hold our wa wallet out of the water as we go down. We'll say, I'll follow Jesus, I'll be baptized into his ways, but I'm gonna keep my wallet way up here. You can have everything else, Jesus, but do not touch this. And when you don't give yourself fully to the Lord, you're never gonna experience the grace of being fully known and fully in and fully loved and fully adopted and fully paid for and fully bled for and fully died for. You're never gonna experience the grace of being baptized into the ways of Jesus. Jesus has all of you or he doesn't have you. Have you given yourself fully to Jesus today? What a question. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse six says this, accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had st started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. 
But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So remember, we're reading 2 Corinthians and they're talking about the Macedonian Christians. And what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to expire the Corinthians by what the Macedonians have done. And so he's writing to Titus and Titus would have been the pastor of the Corinthian church, okay? And so he's saying, hey, as you started, I want for you to continue. I want for you to finish. I want for you to excel in this act of generosity. He's saying, hey, look at what the Macedonians have done. Be like the Macedonians. It's kind of like, be like Mike. Y'all remember that? Michael Jordan growing up, king of the court, best basketball, every player, everybody wanted to just be like Mike. And Paul's going, y'all need to be like the Macedonians. Y'all need to catch up to the kind of generosity that they have. And as you excel in everything, faith and speech and knowledge and earnestness and in love, also excel in this act of grace, in this act of giving. Now, we love to win, don't we? We love to excel, we love to dominate, we love to get first place, gold medal, God bless America, right? We're all about some winners in the house today. Nobody wants to be somebody that doesn't excel. Like you never see this picture. You never see a mom, like a group of moms, they're like huddled together and they're like talking about their kids and their kids are like, you know, two and four and seven. And, you know, maybe one kid's like eight and there's a couple three-year-olds in there and they're all talking. And all of a sudden what moms do, what do they start to do? They start to compete, right? All of a sudden it becomes a competition. It's like, well, my kid's doing this and my kid's doing this and my kid's doing backflips. Well, my kid's do- speaking Greek. Well, my kid reads on a collegiate, you know, reading level, right? That's the way that it goes. Like, even if it's ITT Technical University reading level, it's collegiate nonetheless, you know? My kid's great. You never hear mom say this, "Mm, my third grader's on a second grade reading level, but they're gonna get there someday. They're gonna make progress, I promise. In, In due time, they will catch up. You never hear mom say that. Why? Because the posture, the desire, the hope is that we would be excelling, that we would be growing. Those are the things that we wanna be celebrating. Are you excelling? in this act of grace? Are you excelling in this act of grace? Churches wanna excel in a lot of things. They wanna excel in having an incredible worship experience. They wanna excel in having the most Instagrammable vibe. They wanna excel in having the hippest preacher. They wanna excel in having the most people come. I want us to be a church that excels in the act of giving grace away of saying that we are so willing to give grace to the people who are so desperate to it. What are you going to excel in with your life? Now, one thing that I wanna say here, um, because I know that it's been pretty intense so far, you guys got to dream on Monday, we got work to do on Sunday, people, okay? (laughs) Is that Elevate City Church has been one of the most, the most generous church I've ever been at in my entire life. I told you guys this at um, about the halfway mark of our church that in all of the projections that we did for church planning that it took us six months. And at the six month mark of Elevate City Church, we took in what we anticipated to take in for an entire year worth of giving. And I'm here to report to you today that that trend continued and we took in, in year one, double what we expected to take in. So you should give yourself a round of applause today because here's the truth. I'm preaching to the choir out there. There's a whole lot of you who get this, who have a vision for this, who understand this. Like we are excelling in this Elevate City. I'm I'm not up here today because what what I'm trying to get is the amount of money that we have to go up. God's gonna take care of that. I'm trying to get the amount of givers that we have to go up. I'm trying to get every person to participate, for us to see that this is an all play, that we are not a consuming church, we are a contributing church, that we are not going to be like the rest of church trends where, if you didn't know this, in most churches, this is the way that it works. 20% of people pay for 80, fund 80% of the budget. 20% of people fund 80% of the ministry that happens. I don't want us to be like that. I want us to flip the script. I want us to be a church full of contributors and say, no, I'm gonna step up because I've got a grace account and I wanna give to the kingdom of God. I wanna give so that ever, uh, other people can experience what I've experienced. I wanna give so that other people can know that w- what I know. I wanna give so that I know that when I stand before heaven and I have to give an account for my grace account, that what I hear is well done, my good and faithful servant. I want for us to be an all-in expression of faith. I'm not up here looking for more money. 
I'm up here looking for more faith, for more discipleship. This is about discipleship. This is about who you're becoming and what you're holding on to. And let me say it like this. Like if there's any reservation in your heart today, if you came and you were skeptical and you were cynical and your background has been, man, the church just wants my money and here it is again. I come to this new church and sure enough, on day one, they're talking about what money. I knew it. I knew it. Guys, do you realize it's a holiday weekend? This wasn't like a strategic plan. Hey, the weekend where we will have the least amount of people come to our church, let's talk about money. We're gonna get them. That's a terrible strategic plan. On our like lightest Sunday in six months, let's talk about money. That's not what it's about at all. If you have any skepticism and cynicism, don't give your money here. Don't, don't, don't give your money here, Okay. Because it's not about what you're giving us, it's about who you're becoming. Find something else to give your money to. Find somewhere else to put your money. Something that you're passionate about, something that makes your heart come alive. Shoot, find another church to give it to. There's this church up the road called Stone Creek Church there in Milton, Georgia. And I mean, just try that out for size. Man, find another, I don't care, Passion City, you name it, give it to something because what generosity is going to do is it's gonna make you more like Jesus. I want you to give because what giving does is it makes you more like Jesus. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says this, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You know, it's gonna be really tough to say that you have a genuine love for Jesus if you don't have the attribute in your life that mirrors his the most. The summation, the most famous verse in all of scripture that wraps up our faith, John 3, 16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus' demonstration of his love for us is in what he gave. Likewise, our demonstration of our love for him is what we give back to him in return. You wanna be like Jesus, become a giver. It says that out of his wealth, do you know how wealthy Jesus was? Do you know what he left behind? Do you know what he gave up? Do you know what he let put on the table? Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he is in heaven, place of glory, perfection. He is being worshiped for all of eternity. He is the King of Kings. There is no need, no desire. He leaves that behind to go to a dust-filled Roman empire 2,000 years ago without electricity. No air conditioning, no refrigerators, no Netflix. How can you live without Netflix? He leaves it all behind and he comes. He empties his account to fill up our account. And he does it because of love. I love what it says in verse, in verse eight. It says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. That your love is also genuine. Have you ever been somewhere before? Like maybe in New York City and you're wondering if this is like a genuine purse or is this like a Frada? Is this a Prada or is this a Frada? Is this a Rolex or is this a Folex? Like, is this genuine? Is this real? Is this legit? I don't wanna get ripped off. I don't wanna get taken advantage of. I don't want this to be a scheme. You know that the outside world is looking in on the genuineness of our love and the genuineness of our faith. And a lot of it is in what we're willing to give. They're wondering, will you put your money where your mouth is? If you were to open up your bank account and you were to show it to your friend and they were to make an assessment about what you thought about God off your bank account, would you be comfortable with that? Would you be comfortable with that? It, it leads me to this next idea. This is so good. Don't, don't miss out on this. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse 13. It says, for I do not mean that others um, should be, wait, I may have skipped a verse. Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse 11. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For the readiness is there. It is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. Okay, so, Here's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make sure that we've got a genuine demonstration of faith, that our love for Jesus is genuine and that it's demonstrated by what we're willing to give. Um, 
And, and, and we're wanting to see desire raise up in the house tonight. Like not an obligation to give, but an opportunity to give. Not to give begrudgingly, but to give willingly and cheerfully because God loves a cheerful giver. That's what I'm wanting to see happen. I want to see this happen. There was a girl who... Uh, was here on Monday night and she's a giver. She's a faithful giver, a generous giver. And um, she's got this group of friends that are really skeptical about her going to church and even giving to her church. And she goes, the church is just gonna take advantage of you. They're just gonna take your money. They're, they're just gonna spend it. They're just corrupt, all these things. And she's like, no, 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 I, I'm giving, I'm faithful. This is what I've been called to do. This is what I want to do. And so on, on Monday night, I don't know if you know or not, but we gave a ton of money away. Come on, somebody. We were able to bless some people because you guys have been such a blessing. And we were able to make some dreams come true. We were able to write some checks. Um, I was in small group and uh, one of the couples in our small group was like, I loved Monday night. At the end of your message, when we were just giving money away, I felt like I was on a show of Oprah, okay? You get a car and you get a car, okay? It was just like this amazing day where we were able to be a blessing. And so that girl who I was talking about, she comes um, out of Monday night and she goes, that's why I give. If anybody wonders what the church is doing and they're taking my money and they're giving it away to people who need it and who I don't know, that's why I give. Because we've been blessed to be a blessing and we're wanting to see that happen in this house. We're wanting to see people who've got that kind of mentality, that kind of ideology where they're like, no, 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 like it is a grace account, not a bank account. I want to give. And so Paul is going this. He goes, now finish doing it as well so that your readiness, so that you're ready. Okay, I'm readiness and desiring. I desire to be ready. I want to do this. I want to be a giver, that it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For the readiness is there. I'm ready to do it. I'm willing to do it. I want to do it. I feel faith rising up. I've got this heart to do it. So that the readiness is there. It is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what a person doesn't have. It says, finish the race, finish the drill, finish the well. And, and, and here's the idea, is that, if you have this attitude in you of, I will start to give when I get to point B, like I'm at point A and when I get to point B, then I will begin to give, then you've got the wrong attitude is what Paul's saying. Like, let me do it like this. Um, how many of you guys would love it if God gave you a million dollars? By show of hands, how many of you would love it if God gave you a million dollars, all right? Um, if you're not raising your hand, you're a liar, okay? <laughs> We would all love it if God would give us a million dollars. Now, let me ask you, like, what do you think you would do with that million dollars? I, I think all of us think, oh man, I would write a big check to the church. I would give a lot of money away to people who desperately need it. But the truth is that the evidence of what you would do with a million dollars is in what you do with what you currently have. Do you want to know if you're the kind of person that God can trust with a million dollars? What have you been doing with what God has given you? Like, I want for you to ask it like this. Ask yourself this question. If I was God, would I trust me with more money? If I was God, based upon how I've lived and what I've given and what I've done, would I trust me with more money? Would more money be good for my heart? Do I have the kind of maturity, the kind of generosity, the kind of Christ-likeness where more money would be good for me and good for the kingdom? What a question to ask. I'll be, I mean, it's a, it's a heavy question, but that's the question that Paul is asking today. He's saying, I want for you to be in a place where you give right where you are, not where you wait to get to some fantasy, to some opportunity to the next level or the next career step, the next rung on the ladder and then start to give there. Because if you won't give now, you're not gonna give then. It's a lie, it's a myth that we all fall into. You see, the problem is really with contentment. Let me hear you say contentment. Man, it's one of the prayers that I pray for my life often. God, make me content. Because pastor confession, I think about money a lot, a lot. and. And I like stuff, okay? I'm not the like poverty gospel preacher up here. Like, do you know what makes me love Jesus more? New shoes, okay? Like, I love it. I love things. I love nice meals. I love traveling. I love nice cars. I like shiplap, okay? I just do, confession. I like it. And so I like things. And so what I have to pray often is God make me content. Make me content. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. It says, but godliness with contentment 
is great gain. It's great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. C.S. Lewis had a great quote. It wouldn't be a sermon without a C.S. Lewis quote. You know what I'm saying? And C.S. Lewis said this. He says, wealth has a way of knitting a man's heart to this world. Wealth has a way of knitting a man's heart to this world. But what Paul would say to Timothy is that the secret to life is not having everything you want, but learning to want everything you have. Learning to be grateful for what you've been given and knowing who gave it to you in the first place. If you want to love heaven more, if you want to love the gospel more, if you want to clarify your purpose, if you want to increase your love for the kingdom of God, start to give. The Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, a lot of people misquote that. They say, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. But the truth is, is that it's where your treasure is, there your heart will be because your heart follows your treasure. You want to see passion rise up? You want to see care rise up? You, you want to care about the things of God? You want to stop caring so much about the things of this world? You want to stop being held hostage to the pursuit of more money and a bigger house and the next thing? You want to stop having that just eat you alive on the inside, always looking for the next career step and always looking for the next account and always looking for the next thing that's gonna make you happy for 37 seconds and start to give because as you give, your heart will go to that place. Let me give you a great illustration of this. Um, my in-laws, they don't really care about sports when I, when, when I met them. They did not care, okay? They were like, well, if you call fishing a sport, he sort of cared if you call fishing a sport, okay? But outside of that, not really sports people. But then my wife, Kayla, her freshman year, she went to Auburn University, okay? Now, it's not a great day to be a war eagle, you know what I'm saying? But, but that's where she went her freshman year of college. And pre that, they didn't care about Auburn University at all. Till he wrote a check for her freshman year worth of tuition. All of a sudden, he was warring some eagle, you know what I'm saying? Do you know why? Because he put his treasure there and his heart followed. When you put your treasure into something, all of a sudden you start to really care about that thing. And I'm just asking for some people's hearts to expand for the kingdom. I want for you to love the kingdom of God more. I want for you to love heaven more. I want for you to be more preoccupied with crowding heaven than crowding your house with a bunch of stuff that isn't gonna matter in the end. I want for that to be where our heart is. I want for that to be the posture of this church. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, we'll close with this. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered had little, whoever had gathered little had no lack. Whoever had gathered little had no lack. Now, that phrase at the end, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack is actually a quote from Exodus. And in Exodus, there's this story of when God's people were journeying in the wilderness and um, God provided for them when they had absolutely nothing. And he provided for them with this food called manna. And um, it literally was translated man who, and it means what is it? What is it? Because they didn't know what it was. Um, like the description of it is like a Twinkie and a protein bar, okay? And all of a sudden, every day, these Twinkie protein bars just start falling from heaven. And they're like, man, who? Like, what is it? But there's enough for them every day to eat. There's no food in the desert, but God as provider gives them enough every day to eat. It's a blessing, but it's a blessing that comes with a curse that whoever gathers much has nothing left over and whoever gathers little has no lack. And it was this idea that God said that there will always be enough every single day. The end of every single day, there's gonna be enough manna for you to eat. Like, I, like you don't need to worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. So just trust me with today, trust me with where you are, trust me with right now and trust that I'll provide tomorrow. It was a blessing, but the curse was this, that if you, will, if you stockpile, if you store it up, if you put it in piles and try to save it for the next day that the manna will actually spoil. It will start to go bad. And that stockpile that you've created will start to spoil, but it also starts to spoil in your stomach and you'll start to feel bad and you'll start to feel awful. And the same thing is true for us today. 
If we won't trust God to be our provider, then what we try to hold on to is just gonna spoil our souls. If you try to hold on to money, then what money is gonna do is it's gonna take hostage of you and it's gonna spoil your soul. It's gonna spoil your faith. It's gonna spoil your love. It's gonna spoil this life. Now I'm not saying today that it's wrong to save. It's biblical to save. You absolutely should save. And I'm not saying that it's wrong today to spend. You should absolutely spend. If God has given you money, if he has blessed you with it and you get to buy something and it creates happiness, man, praise God for that. And if you're diligently saving and preparing for your future and for you know, your legacy and retire, man, praise God for that, that you're in a situation for that. The question is when it becomes out of balance. And the question, and where it becomes out of balance, the answer is this. If you are ridiculously saving, but you are not ridiculously giving. It is great to ridiculously save. Stockpile, store it up. But are you as ridiculous with your giving as you are with your saving? And it's fine to spend. Spend some money. Make some ridiculous purchase if God has blessed you. But you better make sure that your ridiculous purchase are matched by your ridiculous giving. Make sure that it makes sense. You see, it's really an issue of the lilies and the sparrows. The lilies and the sparrows, how we think about money. You see, sometimes the, 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 the Bible says it like this, that God, he clothes the lilies and he cares for the sparrows. And the idea of lilies would be like a spender. How many spenders are in the house this morning? Spenders, like I love to just spend money, spend it. Where are my savers at? Where are my savers at? Yeah, y'all are probably the math people, right? So... You got savers and you got spenders and the spenders are, are like lilies. And oftentimes lilies are concerned with beauty. Flowers are beautiful. And the idea of God caring for the lilies is he's, I'm gonna protect what's beautiful. I'm gonna protect what's beautiful. And a lot of times when we're spending, we're spending because it makes us feel beautiful. It makes us feel worthy. It makes us feel like we have value. And then the savers, they're like the sparrows and the sparrows are all concerned with gathering to make sure that there's enough for that winter's coming or an attack is coming. I gotta make sure that there's enough. And so for the, the savers, it's all about security. It's all about security. And so you've got these lilies who are caring about beauty and you've got these sparrows that are caring about security. And Jesus is looking at you right now today going, I'm your security and I'm your beauty. I'm your provider. I'm where you find enough. And until you find that there is enough in me, there will never be enough in this world to satisfy. You know, I read a lot of leadership books and there's this question often, what's a greater motivator? What's a greater motivator? The carrot or the stick? The carrot or the stick, what motivates people towards action? The reward, what you're gonna get in the end. And I'm here to tell you today that there's absolutely a reward for those of you who give, that you're investing in an eternal economy, an eternal entity, one that cannot be shaken, one that is not gonna experience inflation or a recession and that will absolutely return. So, so there is a reward. And then there's the stick, the punishment of like, what happens if you don't give? What happens if you're not obedient, if you're not faithful, and if you are greedy and you're not generous, what happens? So like, what's a greater motivator? If I get up here today and I talk to you all about the carrot, the reward of those of you who give, or the stick, the punishment for those of you who don't, you know what's a greater motivator than the carrot or the stick? It's the gospel, and it's that God took the stick and that he beat Jesus with it so that he could give the reward to you and me that the, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has already paid for everything that we've done, that he's paid for our sin and he's paid for our shame and that we cannot earn his favor. But because he's been so favorable to us, it is a gift for us to be able to give because we've got everything that we need in Jesus. Let me close today with this story from John Wesley. From John Wesley. In 1731, John Wesley began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give to the poor. And he records that one year his income was 30 pounds and his living expenses were 28 pounds. So he had two pounds to give away. The next year his income doubled, but he still managed to live on 28 pounds. So he had 32 pounds to give away to the poor. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds. Instead of letting his expenses rise with his income, he kept them to 28 pounds and gave away 62 pounds. In the fourth year, he received 120 pounds. As before, his expenses were 28 pounds, so his giving rose to 92 pounds. 
Wesley felt that the Christian should not merely tithe, but give away all extra income once the family and creditors were taken care of. He believed that with increasing income, what should rise is not the Christian standard of living, but the Christian standard of giving. One year, his income was a little over 1,400 pounds, but he lived on 30 pounds and gave away nearly 1,400 pounds. Because he had no family to care for, he had no need for savings, he was afraid of laying up treasures on earth so that money went out in charity as quickly as it came in. And he reports that he never had over 100 pounds at any time. Wesley, in 1744 wrote, when I die, if I leave behind me 10 pounds, you and all mankind can bear witness against me that I have lied and died a thief and a robber. When he died in 1791, the only money mentioned in his will was the miscellaneous coins to be found in his pocket. Wesley is the founder of Methodism and made a massive impact because not just of the teachings, but because of the way that he lived his life and he lived his life generously. And I'm not asking that any of us would be like Wesley today. I'm sure not, but I'm asking that a whole lot of us would start to be like Jesus and that we would embrace a posture of generosity that we would be willing to take this step of being a church that excels in this grace as well, because we know who our God is. I don't know your financial situation today, but God does. I don't know what's going on in your bank account today, but God does. And I want for you to know that as I've gone throughout my life, every year, Kayla and I, we're sitting down and we're talking as we make more money, we're asking how much more money can we give? Who else can we bless? And for the 10 years of our marriage is our income has gone up every single year. And we've we've tried to push and say, could we outgive God? Could we outgive God? We are 0 and 10 on outgiving God. You have a provider, someone who knows all your needs, someone who is there for you, who loves you and who is worthy of your trust. Elevate City Church, let's excel in this act of generosity. It's a massive step for us to take. Let's pray, Jesus, we love you. And I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that your promises are true. I thank you that you are faithful to build your church. That with a handful of people, some crazy faith and big dreams and the love of the gospel in our hearts, we've set out on this journey of believing that you wanted to use us to wake up our generation believing that you wanted to use us to see a movement of discipleship sweep across this city and this nation and this world. And God, I don't believe that you're done yet. I believe that you've got some big, massive steps for us to take, steps that will free us, steps that will strengthen us, steps that will make us look more like Jesus. And so God, I just pray that today that we would be so inspired by the gospel, so inspired by what you've given to us that generosity for us would be a joy, that generosity for us would be a privilege, that we would see our bank accounts as grace accounts. And I pray in the beautiful and the matchless name of King Jesus and all God's people said, amen and amen.